please help me welcome Jim McFarland as he addresses the internet, what went wrong. I think the best place to start is, is the beginning of this whole story, because it is a fascinating story. And I, I don't know that what you're going to hear today is, uh, has been told this way anywhere. I've never seen it, and uh, uh, it's not confidential. It's all out in the open, but it's a way of looking at things that I think you'll find useful. So 50 years ago, about, there were uh, four scientists that were huddled in a little conference room in a motel across from Stanford called Ricky's. Those of you who have been at Stanford know Ricky's. And they had two things. They had an idea for uh, a communication system, and they had funding, finally, from the government. And so what their goal was, was to hook together scientists from research institutions around the world on this nice communication system that everybody could just hook into. It'd be easy, be cheap. And they thought at that time, I've seen some of them interviewed since, that they might have two to 3,000 people on this network. Uh, never more than 10,000, and never would it be, could they see it hooked to the power grid. So those comments sound really strange given uh, today where we have an internet that is connecting almost four billion people uh, to the same, same underlying technology. Uh, it is scalable. And they didn't really get what they wanted because what they got was something that w went far beyond their, their thoughts. Uh, and they also got the reason that we're having this topic today. They have an a, uh, electronic resource that is, you know, spreads crime, uh, takes away a lot of our privacy, threatens our national institutions, and it's, it's causing a lot of trouble. Now, one of the, there's many benefits, and I, and I think I started to, I began thinking that maybe I should start this by saying, I know there's plenty of many of you who love your internet, and how dare you, Jim, talk about trashing it. Uh, so I'm not, not going to trash it. But I think it's, uh, it has many, many benefits, and it's probably the fastest adopted technology ever in the history of our country, or any country. I mean, if you compare it, if you go back to the telephone system, uh, when the telephone came out, to get to 50 million users took them how long? 75 years. 75. The television crew was faster. You, they got to 50 million with television in 13 years. And you fast forward to the internet, and Facebook reached five, uh, 50 million in two and a half years. And then that little game, I don't have my phone with me, the handheld game Angry Birds reached 50 million in 45 days. And the best recorded time for someone to fall asleep in one of my talks is 45 seconds. <laughs> and unfortunately, it's dark out there. I can't see who you are. I know who it was. I knew who holds the record. And I think I, I saw that he has he heard that he's coming today also. Uh, I guess he's sleepy. So it's time for his, time for his nap. So uh, there's many good benefits, but we have to be careful of the, of the downside. And, and one of the things we have to watch out for, I'm going to touch on this a little bit later, is that about 4,000 Americans will have their identity stolen during the time that we're having our discussion. So if you happen to be one of those unlucky folks, there will be someone who can, using your identity, can take out loans, buy a car, if you have the right resources, buy a boat, file a false tax return with a refund, go get health care using your insurance, and uh, usually find out later, much later, and it can take years to straighten that out. So that's part of the risk that we face and part of the reason that you need to take some steps, we all do, to keep ourselves safe. And like I said, I will talk about that uh, a little bit later. So the, the reason, let me start this with, the reason people say, why isn't the internet secure? Well, it wasn't designed to be secure. 
That wasn't their purpose. Their purpose was they wanted something fast, they wanted something cheap. And um, when I was running a high-tech consultancy in Silicon Valley years ago, we were putting in large mainframe systems for like Apple and Intel and Northern Telecom. And these, these projects took years. I mean, they could take 18 months. Uh, I think Northern Telecom was three years, went forever. Uh, and I always gathered the executives uh, involved with that particular project at the beginning, and I said to them, I said, these projects are risky and they can fail. Here's the truth. The truth is they don't fail at the end. They fail at the beginning, and you just find out at the end. And you have to make the right decisions today. Well, the Internet decision was not for security. They didn't design it in. Part of the reason was they thought the following. Look, they got two or 3,000 people, scientists, a number of them they know. And so uh, in the early days, they didn't even, have a, uh, didn't even have passwords. They just logged on. Hi, this is Jim from Caltech. And they knew immediately who I was, friendly group. And they figured if you wanted to protect something, you could encrypt it. And if you wanted to designate who it would go to only, you could have some secure uh, authentication set up. So they thought, well, that takes care of it, which is kind of like selling a car to you that doesn't have brakes. That, uh, because everybody has different, you know, someone may drive a lot with their business and you, 70, 80 miles an hour, you need one class of brakes. Someone who just goes between here and Trader Joe's has a different class, so you get your own. And uh, that's essentially what they did. You can roll your own security. Well, we are paying, paying the price for that. And I'm going to show you uh, kind of what I call the cybersecurity food chain of how all of this developed over the years. And I just talked about security. The second part is what's called uh, the World Wide Web. This was developed by a gentleman named Tim Berners-Lee and came online in the early to mid 90s. So this really enhanced the internet's ability to link together massive amounts of websites, not just individuals. And Tim Berners-Lee is today one of the leading proponents for replacing the internet. And he has said that if he had, uh, had the World Wide Web to do over again, security would be his number one objective. Uh, and when he started the World Wide Web, the, it was not any objective. So he kind of kicked it down the, the wall, down the, down the hall to us. The second is there are businesses that use the World Wide Web. We all know about that. And uh, they supposedly are supposed to protect our data and the information they're processing. And the fact of the matter is that uh, you all know this. I mean, it's kind of like, okay, who's the latest breach? Who's the latest hack today? Uh, they have done a very poor job of taking care of our data. So they've kind of pushed it back down the stack. Next stack is social media, and we're going to talk a little bit about this in particular uh, shortly. Uh, but social media has done a wonderful job of aggregating our personal information, using it for their own individual gain and profitability. Uh, we'll, we're going to cover that. And then finally, there's mobile computing. Ever since uh, the Internet was made available for us 24-7, constantly with us. Uh, the whole use of the Internet and all these systems has uh, uh, expanded. And there's so many apps that you can use, and many of these apps have malicious software in them. Many of them will corrupt your phone, and you have to be very, very careful about what you buy. So at the end of this, excuse me, at the end of this chain is us. And so everybody has kicked the ball down to us, and uh, we're kind of out there all by our lonesome, but we have some things that's, that then become expected of us. So things such as dealing with 14 character hieroglyphic passwords. <laughs> so here's an example, or using things like two-factor authentication, which is hard to say three times in a row, you know, it's just difficult. And so we really need things like that. And uh, we're, you know, we're exposed to Tax fraud happens all the time. I have friends who've had their taxes corrupted. Uh, so you're supposed to do credit freezes. And uh, then ransomware will get you if you're not looking. And then you've got phishing attacks. And what's next? Uh, it just keeps going. And pretty soon, I think you get the picture, it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. And I think that that's why so many of us get, like, 
oh my God, there is so much coming, there's so much to do that I'm not gonna do anything. And I see that a lot. I see that in a lot of the talks. People say, you know, there's nothing, Jim, that I can really do that's gonna, well, that's wrong, and we're gonna talk about that. So this is really what happens, and our data, the fact of the matter is our data is out there, and we, we talk a lot about, well, let's protect the social security number and all this. Well, it's gone. So you can just accept that it is, it is history, and uh, anybody who's a criminal that wants to buy it can go to the dark web and buy it, and they can get groups of it, and you can specify, just like on eBay, specify exactly what you want, what types of uh, credit line, what type of uh, income, and uh, you can purchase uh, your information. And uh, surprising how little your social security number can be sold for, usually $1.70 you would find. So as someone has said to me, uh, I was at a presentation uh, uh, by some government officials last year, um, uh, White House and the NSA, FBI, and at, at the noon break, person next to me turned to me, and I didn't know the person, said, you know, they're all saying the same thing. I said, what's that? He said, we're sitting ducks. <laughs> now, we didn't get a lot of encouragement from the White House and the NSA and the FBI that there are solid plans ahead to protect us. In fact, we didn't get any at all. But we have lots of company because our country is also a sitting duck, and I, I know that many of you pay attention to things like this, and some of you may not, but I'll give you just a, a quick breeze through of some of the uh, breaches, some of the attacks that we've had just recently that uh, are, are pretty chilling when you look at them individually and in aggregate. Uh, you may have heard that uh, Atlanta was hit with a ransomware attack, and they, uh, their city was completely down, anything that needed a computer for three weeks, and then it actually took several months to get machines replaced, software up and running, and uh, they couldn't even issue a dog license. It was just absolutely nothing that they could do. And the mayor said it was just a nightmare, and it's just uh, very, very difficult. Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital across the mountain over here in Hollywood is a ransomware victim. Uh, they could not get access to any of the patients, healthcare information, test results, uh, medication, uh, anything. Uh, so all the emergency patients were taken elsewhere, new patients were uh, denied entry, and they were basically doing healthcare with pen and pencil. And it's really scary because they don't know what medications you're supposed to take uh, tonight. Both the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange have had intrusions uh, from both of them from Russia, fishing around in there. They haven't done anything yet, but they, uh, if they're in, they could. Our banks are scared as well. Uh, this is recent, this is uh, a year ago, December. The banks are saying, wait a minute, what if the financial system goes down? How are we going to keep things going? Because of the financial system, crashes. Well, we talk a lot about the power grid, and that is a real risk. But you can imagine our country if we had the financial system go down, and you didn't have access to your accounts, to your credit card, to your money, to your investments, or anything. It would be chaos. It would be a, a disaster. So then speaking of the power grid, we have uh, let's see, they were getting closer here. This is July 31st of last year. The Russians uh, became known, were deeply inside various aspects, 21 locations of our power grid. And according to the reports, I was not there, I can't verify this, but according to the reports, they had their finger on the switch. And if they wanted to, they could do a blackout of some sort, probably a partial blackout, but they didn't. And people say to me, they say, well, of course they wouldn't because we can do the same to them. And we can, and we can. And guess what? Uh, there's not a lot of motivation to do that to each other. There was a study, um, a congressional committee study that was done two or three, maybe it's four years ago now, on what would be the impact of a nationwide blackout extensively. And what they found was in 10 months, if the power grid were to go down, in 10 months, 90% of the United States population would die from starvation, illness, and violence. 
So that's not something we want, and that's not something we would want to do to Russia or China or anybody else. But it does give you pause to think about, you know, they're sitting there, they've got the finger on it, and maybe we need to be a little bit careful. Uh, we don't know. So this, this caused our uh, Department of Homeland Security Secretary, Kirsten Nielsen, has been taking a lot of heat recently down on the border, uh, to say that, guess what, guys, we're now in crisis mode. Well, she's about three years late, but uh, at least the, we're seeing some signs of movement, some recognition from high-level officials that maybe we need to do something. And not to be outdone, the uh, Director of National Intelligence, Daniel Coates, uh, several months later said that our digital infrastructure is under attack and the lights are blinking red. Now, ominously, that comment about the lights blinking red were the same exact comment that was made by the head of the CIA prior, just prior to 9-11. So that didn't make me feel too good. So we get to the point and we say, what's wrong here? Uh, you, America created the internet. We're the strongest nation in the world. We're the most technologically advanced nation in the world. How can this be happening to us? Well, I've given you part of the answer. I gave you the structure of why the security decisions that were kicked down the food chain continuously and they were forsaken every way till it got down to the end. And so you're paying the price. That's part of it. Now the story gets interesting because at this point we're saying, well, what is it that causes these things that enables them to happen, the, the, the breaches. I understand that there's lack of security. What, what's driving it? Okay, and I'm gonna give you three. I, you know, I could pick five or nine or 12, but we don't have time. But I'll give you three of my favorites of what, what has been driving this. The first is lack of governance. And here we're talking about our uh, national uh, government. And I, I would say in general, what I was starting out is that as far as cybersecurity is concerned, we totally, as a country, totally wasted the first two presidencies, Bush and Obama, I'll show you why, with regard to cybersecurity. We totally wasted that time. And in the meantime, our adversaries, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, terrorists, they're arming, they're arming. And uh, we, we, we wasted it. So, Let's look at the Bush White House and what was the problem there. The problem with the Bush era with regard to cyber was that they, they had a valid distraction. It's called 9-11. And that event and the fallout and the repercussions of that event, we still live with it. Try TSA, okay? We still live with it. And that was their focus, was what do we do to prevent this from happening again. Their focus was not on what about something else could happen. Now, if you look back at the book, uh, the 9-11 Commission Report, probably the biggest finding was that 9-11 was the result of a lack of imagination. Well, um, we sure had it, uh, and they were practicing that same lack of imagination again in the Bush administration with regard to, and by the way, this is not a political talk. I'm not, I'm not taking down, I'm not making comments about one president or the other have anything to do with anything other than this is what happened. And this is a, uh, I think it's pretty clear uh, what's been causing these attacks. And so 9-11 Commission, and one of the things they said in the report was we didn't awaken to the gravity of the terrorist threat until it was too late, and that's absolutely true. The lesson here was that we had to be careful if we let an obsession with one threat cloud our realization of a new one. And so we started the Bush administration with a surprise. We ended the Bush administration getting ready for a surprise, but in a different arena, which is the, the cyber arena. So we get to the Obama White House, uh, we have what I would call fear and enablement. Uh, those are two important words here. 
Uh, and I've heard some talks and presentations from individuals who were high-level cyber um, professionals in the Obama White House, uh, and they weren't being critical. They were just saying the way it was, was that there was a lot of discussion about, because attacks were starting to happen big time, uh, attack, uh, what to do about them. And, and uh, there was a tremendous amount of fear that if we were to respond to some of these attacks and some of these breaches and some of these thefts, that that would just incite further attacks. And that's what we mean uh, by the fear aspect. And the way he uh, put it, one of them put to me, he says it was like we were caught, we collectively, uh, the decision makers in the White House, we were caught like deer in the headlights. We were frozen. We didn't really know what to do. And so we didn't do much of anything. Well, while we were uh, looking at the oncoming car, China was busy stealing our intellectual property. And this, this started some time before. Well, I, this chart is uh, a couple of years old. It's from the NSA, National Science Agency. Uh, National Security Agency, sorry. And every red dot is a known intrusion by China for the purpose of stealing intellectual property, military secrets, weapon systems, you name it. That's a lot of dots. That's a lot of dots. Now, if they had physically, imagine this, if they, if China, or anybody, had physically attacked that many sites, there would have been some retribution, do you think? There would have been retribution. They got away with it, and they still are. And in fact, there was an attempt to do something about it, and it occurred here in Rancho Mirage at Sunny Lands in the summer of 2015. President, then President Obama met with President Xi, and one of the complaints, supposedly, from Mr. Obama was that we're tired, sick and tired of you taking our intellectual property and our, our secrets and then using them against us. To which she said, really? Really, we did that? Okay, we'll stop. They signed an agreement that said, okay, we're not gonna do that anymore, America. And as it turns out, just a couple of months later, I was at some briefings and uh, uh, Tom Ridge was, just happened to be there, I, I don't know him, uh, but he was, of course, the first Homeland Security Secretary and, the, and former Pennsylvania governor, and he's now in the cybersecurity business. And so I, at the break, I, I just went up and asked him, and I said, Tom, what do, you, what do you think of this agreement? I mean, this is exciting news between uh, you know, us and Russia, and, I mean, China, and, and he laughed. I mean, he, tr he, he truly laughed. Uh, and he said, there's nothing to that. It's a photo op. He said, you watch. Uh, Nothing is going to happen because if they continue, there are no consequences. And there were no consequences. And so what we have is, you go up to January 29th of this year, and Christopher Wray, the head of the FBI, is testifying in front of Congress. He's saying, China's attacks, in fact, in the last four or five years since that time, have more than doubled. So I, don't, I, think, I think Mr. Ridge, Governor Ridge, Secretary Ridge, was correct that that was phony. And this is, this is interesting because right now we have a president who is engaged in talking with, again, the same President Xi about the same topic. And we're saying, you know, what, the, what are we gonna do this time that's uh, different? Then we also had interaction with Mr. Putin and uh, Foster Grant, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Putin and, you know, so he got into trouble before, uh, Mr. Obama left the White House with this election hacking, tampering, and all this stuff. And, and the sad thing here was the, um, our government knew about this a year before we knew about it, that this stuff was going on, uh, that they were intruding with the political parties and with the, uh, the state election records and all this stuff, but they're really afraid to escalate it because it would scare people. Just, you know, scare people, right? I mean, it's scary. You think about it, if I vote worth something, uh, and what if the answer is no? <laughs> then, uh, it does, it's voter suppression uh, and other bad things as well. Uh, so nothing happened of consequence to China. Nothing happened of consequence 
to Russia. We did expel some uh, Russian diplomats, if you remember, and we closed a compound in, uh, I don't know, New Jersey, someplace. There was a nice kind of resort house that these guys used to uh, rest. We did close that and, and expelled some people. Uh, to which Putin's response was he invited all of the American uh, diplomats in Moscow to a big New Year's Day barbecue. <laughs> and that is a fact. So that's uh, kind of stubbing the nose at us. And then if we move to another present day, uh, <laughs> a lot of characters out there, a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people don't like us, okay? Uh, just don't like democracies. You know, that's what it comes down to. So uh, we got Kim Jong Un, Chairman Kim. Chairman Kim, uh, and he is, uh, they famously did the attack, were behind the attack on Sony Pictures, I'm sure you remember this, it goes back a few years, and there was a picture coming out called The Interview, and uh, it's a terrible m movie, but this movie was coming out, and it, it portrayed some uh, uh, reporters going to North Korea and uh, staging like they were gonna be doing interviews with uh, Chairman Kim, when actually they were there to kill him. And in the end, he did get killed. Well, needless to say, North Korea took a dim view. This was before it was released. They took a dim view of Chairman Kim, who was a descendant of the descendant of the founder of their great republic. And so they attacked, targeted Sony Pictures. They basically took out all the computer systems. Uh, Sony was, uh, they had to do conduct business through text messages. They couldn't pay, do payroll, they couldn't pay bills, they couldn't accept money, they couldn't uh, book any new talent. Uh, and then North Korea also released a bunch of embarrassing emails that, that included things that the executives at Sony were saying about the talent. And they were ridiculing the talent that they're giving all this money to. Well, that was embarrassing. You gotta <laughs> deal with these people every day. And then they said, finally, uh, North Korea, I mean, North Korea wasn't standing up at the time and shouting about this. They did that later. Uh, North Korea said, well, and if you release that film, Sony Pictures, we cannot guarantee, we cannot guarantee the safety of the people who go to see the film. That scared the distributors, and all of a sudden the distribution channel dried up. Now, to this, President Obama referred to this, which was extortion, theft, all kinds of bad stuff, as vandalism and said that we would respond in a time and a manner of our choosing, which was none. So one more time, we've got three strikes and it's bad enough they did it. Uh, basically, they finally said, what's it to you? you know, because they knew that we were not going to respond. And this is the enablement piece that when we got into the second administration that really told North Korea, China, Russia, Iran, that guess what? You can have at it with the United States of America and they're not gonna do anything about it of consequence. The favorite tool of the Obama administration was the sanction, it's still going on, we still use it in the Trump era, was to sanction somebody and say, you know, you're a bad boy and therefore you're sanctioned, which basically means that they, they can't come to the United States, they can't send their children to Harvard, uh, their wives can't shop on Odeo Drive, uh, but other than that, they're doing just fine over there. So we basically let everything pass and our responses were taps uh, on the wrist. And, uh, one of the individuals at one of the briefings I was at, he, he said, he put it this way, he said, America created the internet, but when the game started, we did not suit up to play. In other words, we had decided that it was too risky to re-engage people who were engaging us and actually to treat them nicely, perhaps they would stop. So that's two administrations, and uh, therefore we have a tremendous number of attacks during this period, and I, I showed you through a few of them, there are many, many more. And we roll into the Trump White House. Okay, so like in so many things in that White House, there are mixed messages here with uh, regard of what to do with uh, cyber. Uh, and then during this time, the Russian uh, stuff was still going on, you see, I don't know if you can read this, says, uh, 
Yeah, you can. So uh, they're doing some serious meddling with the elections. Which they, now we're, we're talking 20, 2016 elections when all this was really you know causing problems. And we're still living the the reverberations of this. Obviously, as you all know, we hear about it. it. I mean, this you know drove a lot of cable news ads. I'll tell you, a lot of a lot of networks covered this stuff, and. Uh, Basically, the stance was, there he is again, same glasses. And here's what he said to President Trump. He said, we didn't do it. Well, uh, at least on the outside, other than sanctions, other than a little of this, a little of that, uh, that was accepted. So I think a lot, uh, a lot of people, um, the government and the, and the country, <clears throat> perhaps rightly so, said, hey, we're going easy on the Russians. Why are we going easy? Because they are messing with a, the fundamental of our democracy. So that's a message that's sent if you don't respond to it. Now, on another part of the uh, Trump administration, we have the National Security Agency. Uh, has a new, a new commander, General Paul Nakasone, took over last April, and he testified in his confirm, confirmation hearings the following: We need to make them, the assailants, pay until they change their behavior. So this became the new mantra of the cyber doctrine for the Trump administration. They were going to take the fight. And the plans are drawn up, and some of them are underway with the National Security Agency to take the fight to the people who are instigating, in many cases before the attacks occur. And so uh, that, that's really good. That, that's really progress. We're happy to see that. It's in conflict with the other, uh, and it makes you wonder. So we don't know if this will succeed or not, but we do know the following. We do know that there are diplomatic, here he is again, diplomatic efforts underway. So we know now that President Trump will be meeting with President Xi in March, Mar-a-Lago, to sign a deal with regard to trade, which is Trump has been pushing hard because they've been screwing us in trade, and with regard to the theft of intellectual property. So we're going to sign yet another agreement uh, with people we don't have a reason to trust. But we'll see. We'll see this time because uh, the, 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 the tariffs bite China. They bite them. Their economy is not doing well. When the news that maybe these talks between China and the U.S. were going to produce results with regard to tariffs, Chinese mark, stock market. I know several of you here into Chinese stocks, yeah. Insiders uh, took off. And our markets have as well. We've started 2019, this is uh, what they said yesterday was 2019 is the strongest start of the stock market since 1964. Look amazing, amazing. I didn't notice it in my stocks, but <laughs> it's, <clears throat> but it's happening. It's happening. So, so the fact that we have this diplomatic effort going on, and maybe there's more bite to it, you know, we can all hope, we can all pray, we can all wish that hopefully this will bring an end to some of the threats that are occurring in cyberspace and with regard to improper trade um, relations with, with China. And then finally, I had, had to show this because this week we have uh, President Trump and... Um, Chairman Kim meeting in uh, Seoul, North Korea. And I, for me, this, this struck me because I was an officer in the Air Force uh, during the time, uh, I wasn't doing the bombing, but we were bombing the crap out of Hanoi, just daily, constantly destroying the city and the surrounding area and their plants and their facilities. And here we have a picture of, in Hanoi, we have a picture of Trump and Kim talking about bringing peace to North Korea. So the North Korea, the, the backdrop story here is what? The backdrop story is 
guess what, North Korea? Vietnam, still communist, still has its leadership, and it has enough capitalism to become prosperous. You could do the same. That is the message, and we'll see if that takes. Okay, the second, that's the longest segment. The second segment has to do with the total abdication in the boardroom. I wrote an article for Security Week called, Will This Be the Year That Cybersecurity Breaks Up the Party in the Boardroom? Because, you know, everybody is making money, the stocks are up, the yachts are ordered, planes are coming. And, uh, I mean, that's a valid point. The thing is, that article was written in 2013. And two months later, we had the target attack, which was one of the first uh, real attacks. But that, the, the, the shame of this all is the article is just as pertinent today as it was back then. And here you see, this is on CNBC. You can see some of the many, many attacks. These are, these are records, those records meaning our information, you know, that's gone, that's taken, broken into their systems. And then there was Equifax, and you all know Equifax is the credit rating bureau. There are three of them. And uh, they managed to cough up. I mean, this is their business. If you look at Equifax, what is their one service? It's totally, absolutely based on the management of our personal financial information. That's, that's it, okay? They have nothing else. Do you think they would protect it? No. No. They chose not to. They're careless. They were complacent. And so as a result, you've got somewhere between 146, 150 Americans. You've had all of your financial information taken and exposed and ending up, I'm sure, on that dark web that we talked about before. So at this point, when I say it changes everything, and I was talking earlier about your, your, your social security number, look no further than your friends at Equifax. And I, I was talking a few months, just the beginning of the year, to a former Equifax executive who was saying, it's still chaos there. It's still chaos. They're bringing in consultants, they're you know, hiring and firing people, and they still haven't got their arms around this. Uh, now, none of those companies I showed you in the former slide, nor has Equifax, paid a price for this. You would think, well, wait a minute, you're coughing up data that's used against us. You need to pay. This, this, this is not good business practice, OK? Um, they haven't. They haven't. Now, there is word that the Federal Trade Commission is going to levy some fines on Equifax, but uh, who knows when, if, and, and how much. And so, in spite of the, the press that Equifax hack, hack got, we have it just going on still. So in November, what do we have? We have the biggest theft of records in history from Marriott, our friends at Marriott, the home of Starwood, these nice hotels. 500 million records, in some cases including passports, IDs, driver's licenses, credit cards, password, everything, gone. Wow, obviously they're not learning. No one's learning. So this is what I'm talking about, the abdication responsibility. There doesn't seem to be a lot of responsibility at the corporate level. Therefore, they've made this, they've enabled this whole uh, breach of data out there for the criminals to take. Criminals. I mean, I don't think North Korea is interested in your, well, they might be interested in your, pass, your passport, but they're not basically interested in this stuff. It's the criminals that are after this. So finally, number three. What is number three? This is our favorite people. I call this techs gone wild. So uh, any of you who invest are familiar with the term at the bottom, FANG. It's Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. But these four, these five, companies are among the most valuable companies in the world. They're extraordinarily successful. And they have not always operated in our best interest. In fact, you see them here tossing these $1,000 bills uh, in the sky, because money is good. I was just up, I gave a talk in Silicon Valley, and <clears throat> money is good up there. I'd, I'd love to have a Ferrari dealership there. I'd love to have one, or sell foster grants, either way. 
So the mantra, I'm only going to pick on Facebook. I could pick on YouTube. I could pick on, but let's just pick Mark because he's a, I won't say. Uh, <clears throat> Mark Zuckerberg is the founder, CEO, uh, and his mantra for running the company is, look, what we want to do is move fast, break things, fix it later, okay? Well, they got in serious trouble with uh, the government, had to go to some hearings uh, with regard to the way that their systems enabled the Russian dissemination of, of uh, information during the 2016 election that was polarizing and caused people to uh, react and, and uh, you know, think negatively about Hillary Clinton, about Donald Trump, about whoever. Uh, and, and if you were, if you were, Russia, or anybody who wanted to influence the United States democracy, there could not be a better way to do it than Facebook because of the way it's structured, the way that it propagates these discussions. So if you are a user of Facebook and you get some kind of posting, I don't use it, so I, I probably don't have the right terminology, you get a posting from a friend that says, oh my God, you want to hear the latest crap on Donald Trump, and you say, oh yeah, right, and you send it off to a hundred other people, and they send it off. Okay, so this creates a momentum, and that is what the Russians did. They created all these messages, thousands and thousands of messages. They also bought a small amount of ads, but the ads weren't really needed because they got the people who got excited to uh, do it for them. So the, the economic model of Facebook is as follows. If you're a stockholder, you may know this. Their economic model is they are going to monetize our personal, your personal information every way that they can, and they are going to get it in a number of different ways. And to get their ad revenue up, they want to do two things. They want to rise, increase the user base, which is currently about 2.2 million, billion, excuse me, billion, and they want to increase you, if you're a user, your time, your engagement on the product. Because the more time you're on there, the more ads you will see and the more money they will make. And the way that they have found that they obtain engagement is to put out things that are controversial and put things in your stream, your news stream, feed, whatever it's called, that causes reactions, it causes people to then, again, send this on and, and it's viral. Uh, this was so disruptive and it's still disruptive, we're still having hearings, we're still trying to figure out what to do about it, that the economists uh, actually put out a whole big uh, major article, cover issue, they call it epic fail, okay, that uh, they really have and that uh, there's a second cover they call them a, a threat to democracy. Uh, now, Europe is way ahead of the U.S. in terms of regulations of the social media companies. They have regulations in, it's called GDPR. And they fine, and they have started fining Google, Facebook, Amazon, billions and billions of dollars for violating people's personal rights and personal privacy. And so you're gonna see more of that you know, coming here. Now, Facebook's targets, I'll just quickly show you their targets, uh, that <clears throat> are a little bit unnerving. In other words, they don't just take your data and do something with it, they get data from the outside. So they have had an effort for a number of years to get banks to hand over your financial information. Now, the deal is, it's anonymous. Uh, the real truth is, uh, Facebook can take that information it's anonymous and with their artificial intelligence algorithms, 90% of the time, it's been proven, 90% of the time they can match that information up with you. So they actually know who you are. Uh, the banks have resisted that. They don't think that's perhaps a good thing uh, to do. Uh, next is healthcare, okay? They have sent doctors, Facebook has sent doctors out to hospitals, to clinics and said, look, we would, same pitch. You give us anonymous information, we'll give you X, Y, Z and uh, you know, use it for the, for the overall good of society. Well, once again, they will match up so they would know what your health situation is, you then market ads to, uh, uh, you know, people, uh, you know, selling uh, treatments for that. Uh, it gets really, really scary, and, and there was a big, uh, I guess it was last week, a big top-of-the-fold cover article in the Wall Street Journal about Facebook taking 
information, health information, you may have seen some of this, from apps, health apps, is feeding information, whether you're a Facebook user or not, feeding information into a database that would talk about your health condition, uh, like Fitbit was a big contributor. <laughs> Send off the data, okay? And uh, that's, that again, that's kind of unnerving as you've got these apps sending this data in. And, and a lot of personal, inf uh, female information, a lot of personal information that we won't get into that really is, is sad. And then finally their target is, hey, they don't want to run out of markets. We've got to extend ourselves. So Facebook is limited to 13 and over. Uh, we've got to get to the kids when they're 18 months. And so they have a big effort underway to, uh, to do that. So all that is uh, unnerving. It has a name. It's called surveillance capitalism. And uh, uh, Facebook knows a lot more about us than the National Security Agency ever will. So <clears throat> as a result of this, uh, Roger McNamee, who's a, a very successful venture capitalist, he was an early advisor to Facebook and an early investor. He knows uh, Mark Zuckerberg well. He even introduced Mark to uh, uh, some of his, Mark's you know, key executives now, and uh, very close. And he, over time, figured out what they were doing. In other words, they were, they were improperly monetizing personal information and uh, we're lying about it, basically. If you, if you saw, I don't know if you saw any of uh, Mark Zuckerberg's testimony to uh, Congress, but uh, he was saying that you as a Facebook user have total control over where your information goes. Well, I can show you another slide that shows you six places other than Facebook where it does go, okay? Uh, and so it was, uh, it was uh, Congress just wasn't smart enough to ask the next question, uh, you know, which is, you know, tell me the real answer. So Roger wrote this book. Waking up to the Facebook catastrophe. Just came out two weeks ago. So he called it Zuck, as in you've been, you know what. <laughs> and uh, this is a big seller uh, because uh, McNamee is a great writer and also he has great material. He has all the inside information. So he's, he's, he's exposed. So if you get a chance and you like to uh, lick your chops over what Facebook is doing, this is a good one. So what about the future? And uh, difficult to project, but I will say this. <clears throat> we'll say this. Uh, technology continues to advance. And, and it's a, let's put it this way. The rate of technological advancement is as slow today as it will ever be in your lifetime. It is going to continue to accelerate. And unfortunately, the, the innovation and technology leads the ability to control that. And that gap is what we're dealing with currently. We don't have the ability to control. So uh, there will be things two years from now that I would be up here talking about that don't even exist in anybody's mind today that are uh, threats. So that we have to be very careful about. So we have a, you know, we have a resource, very powerful resource that we have to be very careful uh, how we use. Uh, and until we change some of our institutions and the way that they approach it, we're in trouble. There might be some sign that there's help. Uh, this morning, Congressman Benny Thompson uh, was in having hearings. He's the chair of the Homeland Security Commission, so a recent attacks. And so he was he's starting hearings on the threats that our transportation system is uh, under with regard to cyber. So I think that's a positive sign. But it still comes back to us, and let's be specific, it comes back to you. And so what I tell people, people say, well, this is unnerving, and uh, you know, what about this, what about that? And I say, well, we can't control what goes on with the power grid. We can't control what goes on in the municipal railway and uh, that type of thing. We'll be victims of it, but we can't control it. But we have to focus on what we can control. And uh, <clears throat> that's where it's so important to have some good, you know, some good practices. Now, I have, uh, you, you may get this when you leave tonight. Uh, this is free. Uh, there's a pink sheet back there. And it uh, has five steps, things that you can do to protect yourself in this environment. And I limited it to five because I could give you 20. No one's going to read 20. No one's going to do, no one's going to do five, but you might do two or three. <laughs> <laughs> I've done this before, so I know. Uh, 
Anyhow, it's a guidebook for you to say, gee, maybe I should consider doing these things. Given that your data is out there, given that the criminals are sophisticated and persistent, there's a couple of things you need to watch out for. One is, if your data is out there and is subject to theft, and your identity is subject to theft, which it is, a paramount thing is if you have any assets at all, you need to freeze your credit reports. Why? Because if someone has stolen your identity and they want to go open a loan or file a tax return or fraudulent or anything else, where they need to get a credit report, they cannot get it because it's frozen. And Equifax and the others cannot give it out. So you can do that. It is now free by congressional decree. So it is free for the next year. All you have to do is contact them. The information on contact information on doing that is here, it's yours for free. And you have to do it with all three credit agencies. And you have to do it if there's you and your spouse, you have to do it for both of you. It's free. Now, you might say, well, what if I want to, you know, go in a new Ferrari or something, you know, um, and I want to do a lease, they're going to check my credit. And that's right. And so you would get a pin that unlocks that for that transaction, and then you reinstate it. So it's really important that you do that. The other thing is to understand uh, this whole phishing thing. 92% uh, or some large number, it's the latest number I've seen, of cyber attacks occur. They start with phishing. And uh, this is where you're getting emails, could be from Facebook, could be from anywhere, uh, that are fraudulent, that are trying to get you to click on a link or uh, respond in some way. And you have to know how, what to look for. Uh, you know, for. So phishing has become really serious. One of the things that's in the pink sheet is a video, it's a five, seven minute video uh, that you can access for free that gives you some pointers on what to look for when you've got these emails. And we all get them, you know. I can't go through, this isn't a clinic, I can't go through all the different things that can happen to you uh, with regard to people trying to get your, your money. And uh, you really need to learn how to do it and protect yourself. The other is this, we're back to this two-factor authentication, sometimes called multi-factor authentication. And basically, this is a really good thing for all of your financially oriented accounts or anything that's sensitive, not all of your accounts. I mean, this is, this is where, if you probably know how it works, if you go to log in to Wells Fargo, let's say, and you have this service set up, then Wells Fargo will send you a, a five-digit code, let's say, on your cell phone. I don't have a cell phone, isn't it, with me. Uh, you look at that, and you enter it in, it lets you into your system. So if the criminals who have your access information don't have your phone, they cannot get in and the chances are they won't have your phone. So this is absolutely critical. Uh, it is also free, and uh, if you don't do this with your financial accounts, uh, you're really putting yourself at, at, uh, at risk. Some, some, uh, some organizations require it. Uh, USAA, where I, I do some investing, uh, they require it, and others do it too as well. And that is what happened. Thank you all very much.